This is the Essential Maintenance Practice Training or EMPs for the Lead and Asbestos Regulatory Program from the Vermont Department of Health. My name is Erica. I am the Lead in Healthy Homes Inspector for the Department of Health Childhood Lead Poisoning and Healthy Homes Program. You can contact the Lead and Asbestos Regulatory Program at EMPCompliance at Vermont.gov and the numbers there as well, 863-7200. I am the one doing the training today, but all questions you should send to the regulatory program because they are the body that will enforce action and help you with all of your certification questions. You can also find information for lead and asbestos at our website, healthvermont.gov. I would just use the search engine and put in asbestos or lead or whatever you're looking for. So why are we here today? We're here because lead is a neurotoxin. It affects the brain, brain development, and actually all bodily organs. It's, we talk a lot about the effect of lead on the brain, but it actually affects all of our body. It is a poison that even in small amounts can strongly affect all of us, as you saw in your videos. However, we specifically worry about children because most brain development is done by the age of six. So if damage occurs to your brain before the age of six, then it can make a big impact on the rest of your life. And the reason children specifically, because everybody can get lead poison, but children are specifically apt to get lead poisoning because they engage in hand to mouth behavior. So, you know, little kids, they stick everything in their mouth, hands, toys, stones, dirt, whatever they can find, they put in their mouth. And then if what they put in their mouth is contaminated with lead, either lead dust or lead from the soil, or they eat a paint chip, whatever it's from, then it gets into their body and then can affect their bodily organs and their brains. So because young children engage in this hand-to-mouth behavior, that's what puts them most at risk of ingesting lead. My degree is in early childhood education, so I can tell you that hand-to-mouth behavior for little kids is inevitable, it's normal, it's what kids do, so you cannot stop the behavior. What you need to do is create a environment in which that normal child behavior of hand-to-mouth it can be done in a safe environment. So kids eat it, we breathe it in. Usually if we're doing something unsafe, either unsafe work practices on lead paint or some kind of a job or a hobby that works with lead. So we're breathing in the lead and children are eating the lead. There are some secondary sources that I'll talk about before we get into the nuts and bolts of the lead law itself, because over the years, I have definitely seen most of my cases have been from a housing source, either deteriorated paint, unsafe work practices, delayed maintenance, contaminated soil from housing or contaminated soil from leaded gasoline. So it's usually more of a source like that, but I have come and run into secondary sources over the course of time, like toys, especially toys made in China or made in Mexico, where they don't have as strict a guidance for the rules of what toys can contain. I mean, there are definitely rules, but other countries don't always follow the rules. And sometimes American companies that have their toys made overseas, they might have the rules in writing, but the companies don't always follow them to the letter. So there can be a toy issue. And one thing to think about is when I say toys versus collectibles is that, like I said, there is a rule consumer products can in toys, which are by definition made for use of somebody 13 and under. So if it's a toy, that's made for kids 13 and under, there are strict guidelines about how much lead there can be in that product. Collectibles, which can often look like toys, like a John Deere collectible tractor versus a John Deere regular tractor that's on the toy shelf. Collectibles, because they are made for adults to collect, 
They do not have the same rules and guidance for lead in the product. So when you're buying kids a toy, make sure it's a toy and not a collectible because that might make a difference as to how much lead there is in there. We had a problem a long time ago. I haven't seen it so much recently, but there was a problem with candles. They put a piece of wire in the wick to make them burn longer. And unfortunately, some of those wires were lead, so it created it burned the lead, created a breathing hazard, and then it settled into lead dust in the environment. Bullets and bullet making, most bullets are still made of lead. So if you're doing a lot of shooting, it heats up the lead when it goes through the barrel of the gun, so it vaporizes it so you can breathe it in, plus it can settle onto surfaces as dust. Some people make their own bullets and they melt wheel weights or things like that to cast bullets. Again, as it's melting, it vaporizes. You can breathe it in. And also uh, it settles into contamination around the area that the lead was melted. And sometimes kids like to play out in that area, want to see what the parents are doing or whatever. So it can create hazards that way. Fishing sinkers, the small ones can't by law be lead anymore. So don't get caught with them. They're the number one cause of accidental death in loons. That's why they banned lead in fishing sinkers for I think it's half an ounce or less sinkers. So make sure you don't have any of those and that kids don't go fishing with those. Cultural remedies, we've run into body powder from the Dominican Republic, candy from Mexico, different Chinese medicine remedies for stomach aches, which is interesting because lead can give you a stomach ache. But there are some different cultural remedies and spices and things like that that can sometimes be problematic for lead. We ran into a problem with window blinds where they were using lead in the vinyl as a stabilizer. And when it was in the window, the sun would make the lead chalk up on the surface. So then if you touch the window blinds, you got lead on you. Furniture, people refinish old furniture. One of the things now is the distressed look. So people have old painted furniture that's kind of chipping, peeling, and that's the look they're going for. People can just do a couple coats of clear coat sealer on those pieces of furniture if you want to keep the distressed look with keeping it safe. I ran into a case actually where they had these painted metal chairs in the at the dining room table and it was lead paint. I actually had a family that had a painted kitchen table that was deteriorated and distressed and it was positive for lead and they were eating their food on it. One thing with furniture to be careful of too and furniture and building components is if you go to like those salvage places just keep in mind that just because it looks bare doesn't mean it's actually lead free. If they're stripped and dipped and look like they're bare, the wood itself could have had lead in it. And unless you seal those surfaces, you can still actually get lead, even though there's no visible paint on them. So that's something to keep in mind if you like old building components. And we've had problems over the course of time with people making their own maple syrup, getting old sap pans with lead solder and sap buckets with lead solder that they use to just make a few gallons in their backyard. We've had a problem with some of my families where they've tested their maple syrup and found the maple syrup to be high. So those are some of the secondary sources that sometimes I run into. Usually when I go out and there's a kid that has an elevated level, it's usually a housing source, but I often look at these other things as well just to make sure and I get the overall picture of where the possible lead hazards might be in the home. So when does this law apply? All pre-78 residential rental properties and child care facilities. So it depends on the age of the property. The year that the building was completed is the year that you go by. And if it was built before 1978 and it's a residential rental or a child care facility, then you have to be in compliance with the Vermont lead law. One of the big things that I think you need to come away from this with is that all painted and stained surfaces, and I include stained surfaces purposefully, we talk about paint all the time, but actually varnishes, stains, and things like that can contain lead as well. So any painted and stained surface in a pre-78 building is assumed to have lead unless proven otherwise. 
And the only way to prove otherwise is to hire an inspector with uh, what's called an XRF machine. It's kind of a fancy ray gun looking thing that goes through using HUD protocol and test surface by surface. And if the machine that reads through multiple layers, if all the surfaces tested are less than what's considered lead-based paint, then you would be a lead-free property. But unless you've had that inspection with the XRF machine, not with the swab kits, not with anything else, it has to be a licensed inspector with the XRF machine. Other than that, you have to assume if it's part of the pre-78 property, you have to assume that all painted and stained surfaces have lead. So the basics of the law are this, and we'll go into each of these a little more in depth, but this is the basic stuff of the law. The visual inspection at least once every 365 days inside and outside. So you look through everything inside and outside at least once every 365 days. That's just using your eyes. You don't need any other equipment. Safely repair any deteriorated paint. Safely clean three different times after the work. Yearly in common areas and at every change of tenant. You give information because information is key. There's a pamphlet. There's lead disclosure, which is a state and federal rule. There's a copy of the compliance statement that you do when you're in compliance with this law. And there's also a poster that you put up. And there's also window well inserts and we'll go into those in more depth. But those are the high points of the things that we're gonna talk about today. And as I said, all surfaces are assumed to have lead unless you can prove otherwise. So the first thing you're gonna do is your visual exam say you're just learning about this law so now you're going to go and make sure you're in compliance or you just bought the building the first thing you always do is a visual exam there's the sample forms on page 23 and 29 in your manual so again your manual is where you're going to find a lot of this stuff but the key thing with the visual exam i think is you need to document i took a training years ago when I first started this job with a state police investigator. And basically he said, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Based on that, you wanna have pictures and everything in writing and you know notes and your receipts and all of these things can help you document that you did what you say you did. And now that most of us, granted, not everybody has a cell phone in their pocket, but most of us have a cell phone that takes pictures. So it's really easy to take pictures. Say a tenant moved out, you go in and take pictures. And you also had pictures from before they moved in. And now you've got of evidence of, say they did a lot of damage to the property you have evidence that you can withhold their security deposit because you have evidence of what it looked like when they moved in and what it looked like now. This is why I withheld their security deposit because I had to pay for this, 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 and this. Or somebody moves in, their kid has an elevated blood blood level after a while. They say you're not in compliance with the law. You can have proof along with your compliance statement. You've got visual proof that this is what it looked like, you know, three months ago when they moved in or six months ago when they moved in. So document, 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 and take pictures if you can and keep your documentation. That's key too. You know, don't every year go through your files and throw things away. I recommend at least keeping your documentation, your sample forms, all of the stuff that you have. Keep it for at least the amount of time that you own the property, but I actually recommend keeping it afterwards as well or maybe turning it over to the new owner. So you wanna make sure you keep your documentation. I, you know, it never hurts to have it because you never know what's gonna happen in the future. So document everything and keep it. So your interior visual, what you're looking for is any kind of deteriorated paint. And deteriorated paint is active chipping, which is pretty obvious, but peeling gouged surfaces where, you know, just a riding toy went through and gouged out a chip of paint, friction marks, so the doors that rub, floors, thresh, the thresholds of doors. Nobody looks at the thresholds of doors. They're always deteriorated from friction because that's where your feet hit. 
stairs, you know, the, those friction marks where your foot goes along the, the front of the, the tread, the bull nose, and even cracked. When you see the 10 layers underneath and it's all small little cracks that looks like lizard or alligator skin, that's why they call it alligatoring. That's pretty common that, to be lead paint and it deteriorates in a very specific way. So any of that is considered deterioration and needs to be stabilized, which is basically sometimes you need some prep work, but you need a coat of paint over top of it. So anything that's not intact, fully intact, is what you're looking for. And you're looking for greater than or equal to one square foot of deterioration per room. So you're gonna walk into the living room. You're looking at the windows, the doors, the walls, the baseboard, the floor, the heating unit, anything that is painted or stained in that room, you're looking at the condition of it and you're adding up all the little areas that are deteriorated. Once you get to one square foot or greater, which really isn't that much when you, when you think about it, one square foot, so 12 inches by 12 inches square. Once you hit that amount or greater, you have to fix the whole room. Technically, and this is what I want you to remember, is that one square foot or more is kind of your action level. That's when you have to fix it. However, I don't recommend you get out the tape measure and you measure that little chip here and that little ding there. Just give it the eyeball. If there's more than a little bit of deterioration, you know, a little amount, maybe a few dings out of the doorway. If there's more than that, fix it. It's a lot easier to slap a coat of paint on it now than it is to wait until it deteriorates more and creates more of a problem and creates more of a work, more of a job. So it's a lot easier to do a little bit of work up front than it is to wait for it to be, you know, more deteriorated to fix it. But technically you do have that one square foot de minimis where if it's under one square foot, you don't have to fix it. If it's greater than one square foot total for the room, you got to fix the whole room. And you're looking at all areas that are accessible to tenants. And this is physically accessible to the tenants. Because just telling them they can't go to a certain place doesn't mean they can't go there physically. So you need to look at all the surfaces inside, attic, cellar, everything like that, unless it's physically blocked from tenant use. And that's, again, not just saying don't go there. It's not just having a shut door. It's having a padlock door or a locked door with a key that the tenant doesn't have access to. Other than that, they're considered to be accessible areas and they have to be in compliance with the law. You have to do this visual at least once a year and again, every change of tenants. So if you keep your tenants, you might only have to do this once a year. If the tenants turn over every three months, you're going to have to do this four times a year. Another good reason to keep and, and maintain the property and get good tenants because you don't have to do it as often. If you do find that greater than one square foot of deterioration in that room, and each room kind of starts it again. So you go into the living room, you look for that one square foot. If there's greater than one square foot, you fix it in the living room. Then you go into the kitchen. If there's greater than one square foot in the kitchen, you fix that. It's not, each room doesn't add up together. It's each room as a separate unit that you go by. But once you find that greater than one square foot of deterioration per room, you have 30 days to fix it. That's an important thing to remember is the 30 days. So this visual form is in your manual. You don't have to use this form, but it's, a, I think, a pretty nice form. It gets what you need and it's pretty compact. You can create your own. You can just have a notebook that you write in for each building that you own. However is best for you to keep it for yourself. But this is just something that you can use. But you'd want to have something that kind of catches these type of things. So if you look at this, you can see that the date of the visual inspection was August 29th of 2001. And the person who inspected it was Jason Jones. His certification number is in there. You'll have all of your own certification numbers. The owner is Jason Jones. So he's the owner and he's also the one doing the EMPs. Sometimes the owner's different. You know, it might be Jason Jones is the owner and 
Jason Smith is the property manager, so he's the one doing the inspection. The address and which apartment or common area you're doing. So you'd have one for unit one, one for unit two, things like that. In unit two, Jason looked in the hallway. That's considered one unit. And he found less than a square foot of paint. He found approximately eight square inches on the baseboard. So technically he doesn't have to fix it. It's not greater than that one square foot. However, touching up eight square inches on a baseboard right now is a pretty quick and easy job. If you come back next year and it's been allowed to deteriorate further, it's gonna be a bigger job, maybe do it now, but technically you don't have to. In the living room, however, Jason did find more than one square foot of deterioration. So he did the visual on 829. He went back the next day on 830 and he stabilized three window sashes, all the baseboard and a door jam. So these are the kind of things you want to document. Again, in the bathroom, he found greater than a square foot of deterioration. The bedroom, there's greater than a square foot. And he documented when he did the work. And the work was performed, if you see on the bottom, the person doing the visual doesn't necessarily have to be the person doing the work. So Jason Jones is certified and he did the visual, but he didn't have time to do the work or he had a broken arm at the time. So he hired Joe Workman, who has a different EMP certification number to do the work. You're kind of catching hopefully that different people can be doing different things and the need for certification is there for most of it. Your exterior visual is pretty much the same. You just need your eyeballs and you're looking at all buildings and components accessible to the tenants on the outside. So everybody thinks of the house, but you're also looking at the garage, the shed, the fence, the picket fence that's around the yard. Anything that's part of the property that is not physically blocked from tenant access. So again, you might say, well, I told the tenant they can't use the garage but it's on the property and physically you can get to it. You can touch it. You not, might not be able to get inside it if it's locked and you can't get inside it. You wouldn't have to do the inside, but you would have to do the outside because physically they can reach it. And a little kid, I don't know how many of you have little kids, but the more you tell them not to go somewhere, the more they're going to go to that place and be sneaky about it too. It's all of the areas that are physically accessible on the outside of, but still on the property. We've had the question in the past of what if, say, you have the house on one side of the street and the garage or the barn or something is on the other side of the street, and there's that physical road in between, and the tenants don't have legal access to the barn to store their things in, then you wouldn't necessarily have to do the barn. You just have to do the house and whatever's on that side of the street. But you're looking for the same thing. You're looking for that one square foot of deterioration, but instead of per room, you're looking per side. So if you're looking at the front of the house, that's the A side. You're looking at everything on that side, the walls, the corner board, the eaves, the, the high little turret that's on there the foundation if it's painted, all of that is counted and you're looking for one square foot of deterioration or more. Then you go to the next side and you look for that one square foot on that side. So again, you can have different results on each side, just like you can have different results on each room inside. You do this at least once a year and again at every change of tenant. So it's the same for the interior visual for that. Usually when you do your visual, you have inside and outside, you have 30 days to fix it. If you went tomorrow and you found a problem on one of the sides of the house, you have 30 days to fix it. However, because this is Vermont and we recognize that you can't paint certain times of the year, if the exterior visual takes place after November 1st, you have until May 31st of the following spring to actually fix the paint or stabilize it. But that doesn't let you off the hook in the meantime. You do have to do what's called an interim control, which is blocking access to that deterioration. And a little bit further there, we're gonna be talking about different ways to do that. But after November 1st, you may have until May of 31st of the following year to fix it. Those are two dates to really remember. November 1st, 
and you may have until May. You may have until May 31st to stabilize it, but you got to do something in the interim to keep it safe until you can actually paint it. But if you found the problem on the outside tomorrow, you have 30 days to fix it. So this again is in your manual. It's an in sample inspection form. Create your own or use this one. So again, Jason Jones, he went on November 1st to do the inspection on the exterior of 123 Main Street in any town, Vermont. And on the house, all sides, maybe they just painted it recently. A, B, C, D, so that's the ace is the street side and then B is to your left and it goes clockwise from there. All sides of the house, A, B, C, and D have no deterioration at all. So great, no work to be done. On the garage on A and B sides, there was no deterioration. However, on the C and D side, there was greater than a square foot of deterioration. But if you look back to the top, it's November 1st. You have until May 31st of next year to fix that paint. But you have to do some kind of an interim control. So what Jason did was he installed snow fence to limit access. So he put snow fence up around, and you can see the dotted line on the diagram. He put snow fence six feet away from the building, out and around on those two sides so that nobody could come into contact with that deteriorated paint until he could get to fixing it. The big takeaway I think for this one is that, and a reminder, is that all interior and exterior surfaces fall under the law unless they are physically blocked from tenant access. That's a big one. So you've done your visual inside and outside. Inside you found in the living room that there was more than a square foot of deterioration in that room, so now you're going to do the work. For your interior, you're going to do go working in this living room, so you're bringing your six mil plastic and you're blocking access. If it's a single room you're doing in the inside, you can, you know, just uh, put your caution tape at the door or if you have your cones and your tape and things like that, you know, however you can block access into the room itself. Talk with tenants about their role. This is a big one. They need to keep their kids and pets away. They need to move their belongings either out of the room or all the way. If it's something big, you can plastic it off, move everything into the center room. But I recommend that you get them to move their belongings, you know, even if you have to provide totes or something so that they can get things out of your way. Um, it's always better if they move it because then things don't get, you know, lost stolen, broken. It's best if they do it themselves. You're going to talk to them about staying out of the work area. You can do the work when people are in the unit, but it's a lot easier if they're not. So talk to your tenants if they're going to go be going away for the weekend or if it's a quick little job and they can go out for the day or they can go to the park for the afternoon. Anything to make it a little bit easier so that kids and pets don't become very interested in what you're doing and poison themselves or create a hazard. So you're going to talk to the tenants about all of that, talk about how they can go in and out if, if that's going to be a problem for while you're doing the work. But the best thing is to have a good rapport with your tenants and tell them what's going on and why and why you need them to move their stuff. And I think once they understand, you know, they'll be willing to help. For exterior site setup, it's pretty much the same thing. You've got your six mil of plastic, taking your precautions to prevent the plastic from billowing up because even though it's a nice calm day, we all know Vermont and the weather can change in two seconds and you get that big gust of wind that blows all the paint chips all over the place and now your pickup time is greatly increased. I like what they did in the video where they took some like two by fours and they kind of wrapped the edges of the plastic in that and then like put in a stake or whatever that's much more than just you know putting a couple rocks on the edge and hoping the wind doesn't come up i really liked that piece of wood that's really going to prevent you from having your plastic billow up you're going to have block access so you're putting you're taking your plastic and you're putting it 10 feet out from your job so if you're working on the whole side of the house, you've got 10 feet out from that is your plastic. 20 feet out is where you're going to put your caution tape, your signs, your cones, 
that way there's a buffer between the passerby, the curious kid, and your actual work site. So 10 feet out for your plastic, 20 feet out for your signage to tell people not to come into that area. And again, talking and communication with your tenant is key. What you're doing, when you're gonna be doing it, what specifically you're gonna be doing, telling them that you know the kids aren't gonna be able to play out in the yard on this day or whatever, this time. Moving their belongings if they've got a sandbox out there or covering it up. Staying out of the work area, how they're going to get in and out while you're doing the work. Those are all things that you want to talk to people ahead of time, so it makes it easier for everybody. Now this is a picture of what happens if you don't put your 10 feet of plastic down. And basically the dotted line is where the plastic would have been if they had chosen to do the right thing. They didn't. So now we've got all this contamination and keep in mind that a paint chip the size of your pinky nail can put a child's blood level over 20, which is considered severely lead poisoned. A child has to be medically treated at 45 or greater. So a couple of these paint chips that are on the ground right here could put a kid in the hospital. A handful of them could kill them. This is a huge problem and they've contaminated if the soil wasn't already contaminated it is now so instead of having plastic down where they wet scraped and wet sanded and everything fell onto the plastic and then they folded the plastic up and threw it away and the job was done now they had to and this was a actual abatement job so they had to pick up all the paint chips dig out the soil bring in new soil so it created a whole huge expense and a problem and they never got hired for an abatement job again. So just a little bit of prep time, a little bit of plastic and, you know, it would have saved a lot of, of heartache as well as the idea that you could have killed a child with what was on the ground here. So good setup is very important. If it is after November 1st when you find your exterior problem and then again you have you may have until May 31st to fix it but you've got to do something in the meantime to keep people from accessing that hazardous area. So you can cover the deteriorated area with plastic building wrap carpeting for the porch floor that indoor outdoor carpet things like that. You can block access by putting fencing six feet away from out from the deteriorated area so people can't touch it. These are some pictures of things you can do. This is covering those areas with plastic. And I like this the way it's seasonally deferred maintenance. <laughs> and this next one, you've got the side of the house covered with Tipar and the one on the right, they built out using wood and the snow fencing, they built out away from the deterioration so that nobody could get to it. So those are the things that you can do if you find your exterior problem after November 1st. You have 30 days to do the interim control, but you may have until May 31st to actually do the paint stabilization. But just like for inside work, you have 30 days. For outside work, you have 30 days. Or if it's after November 1st, you have 30 days to do that interim control. So you've done your visual, you've figured out that you need to do some of the work, you've set up your work area inside and outside, and now the actual safe work practices. Basically, you work wet. You want to avoid anything that causes stuff to fly around, chips, dust, particles, because then you're going to possibly create a hazard in the environment, plus you're poisoning yourself. So that's what you want to avoid so you work wet. So you wet scrape, you wet sand. You miss the surface a little bit before you scrape it so that everything that you scrape off falls to the, the plastic. Instead of dry sanding where you're going to create lead dust which can fly around and, and contaminate surfaces and also you're going to breathe it in because remember we breathe it in while the kids eat it. So what's on the surfaces from your wet uh, dry sanding or if you power sand or something like that, 
kids are going to get that on their toys, their hands, and they're going to put it in their mouth. They're going to ingest it and they're going to get poisoned. You, while you're doing that unsafe work practice of dry sanding, you're breathing it in and you're getting lead poison because you're inhaling it. So you work wet, you wet scrape, you wet sand. You can either wet, wet, uh, wet regular sandpaper or use those um, textured sanding blocks that are made to work wet. Absolutely no power tools. There's really no way to make that as safe as just working wet. So no power tools. And you don't have to scrape all the paint off. If it's just a ding in a doorway and it's kind of, you know, it took a chunk out, but it's solid, you can just paint over that. If you do have to do some prep work, if there's loose stuff, you don't want to paint over the loose stuff because that's going to just come off very easily again. So you do what's called scraping to resistance. You miss the surface, you take your scraper, you scrape the what easily comes off. If there's a hard edge between what's left and what was taken off, you don't really want to paint over that hard edge because then it's going to be real thin there and it's going to deteriorate. So what you, you do is what's called feathering. So you just wet sand. It doesn't have to be perfectly flat, but if you wet sand it so that it's a little smoother transition from the five layers that are left in the one layer that you scrape down to. If you get a smooth transition from those two layers, you're going to get a better coat of paint over top and it's going to last better. And you don't need any special paint. It's really just whatever paint the job calls for. So talk to your paint guy and know whether it's inside or outside, whether if it's what's there was an oil based paint. Yeah, I, I don't think you can put latex over it, so you'd have to talk to your um, paint guys to what you're painting over top of so that you get the best coat of paint to put on top, but it doesn't have to be any special lead paint. I mean, there's encapsulants out there, which one, you're not required to use, two are very expensive, and three, it requires special knowledge because if you just put some of those thick encapsulants over regular paint, it just strips off the surface. So you don't need encapsulants. You don't need that Bitrix lead paint that tastes bitter. You might want to put that in if you got a chewer in the house, but generally it's just basic regular paint. Things that are prohibited by law that you absolutely cannot do is dry scraping and dry sanding, because again, you're creating hazards for yourself and others. Open flame burning or torching, one, while you're burning that lead paint, it's vaporizing, it's settling into lead dust, and you're breathing it in. Plus, you could burn down the house, you know, torches in an old 200-year-old building, never a good idea. Heat guns, kind of the same reason you can't use a heat gun operated at temperature greater than 1100 degrees. It vaporizes the lead, so you're breathing it in, and then it can settle into lead dust. You can use heat guns that are operated at temperatures less than 1100 degrees. They don't work as well, but you can use them. It's just not going to take as much off because the 1100 degrees is kind of the key. The reason it comes off so easily then is that you've softened up and vaporized some of the lead. So it works really great, but you're poisoning yourself and others possibly. So no heat guns operated at a temperature greater than 1100 degrees. No power washing or hydroblasting. It's a little counterintuitive because we tell you to work wet, but if you're power washing or, or hydroblasting, you're actually knocking stuff off that you can't catch. And the water's contaminated as well. So, you, and you can't catch all of that water. So, you don't, you can't use power washing and hydroblasting. Any mechanical removal, even if it's HEPA shrouded, they do make what's called a high efficiency shroud for some of these tools and the feds let you use them in some cases, but the state law does not. So no mechanical removal, no power sanding, power grinding, sandblasting, nothing like that, even if you have those HEPA shrouds. And no chemical stripping products. Creates a very densely hazardous sludge that's difficult to get rid of. So no chemical stripping products and definitely not for the lead so much, but for can the fact that it causes cancer, don't use any stripping product that has methylene chloride, even in your own personal use, because I don't think they sell it in Vermont anymore, but methylene chloride causes cancer. It's a pretty strong carcinogen. So no chemical stripping products at all, but definitely not anything with methylene chloride. The key thing is working wet is working safe.
all of that led up to some very simple working wet is working safe, bottom line. So that's the work practices for the lead safe cleaning. It's kind of the same as the lead safe work practices where if you've ever done any painting before, you'll see that it's not too different. It's just a, a few extra things to make it safer. The same thing with cleaning. Instead of a regular vacuum, you have a HEPA vacuum. And basically in order to clean safely, first thing you do is HEPA vac the horizontal surfaces, anything that could hold dust. So it's kind of the common things you can think of when you think of horizontal surfaces, the windowsills and the floors. But you also don't want to forget the top of the baseboard, the top of the heating unit, the top of the door frame, the shelving, anything that, that sticks out far enough for dust to collect on it and it's horizontal is something that you have to HEPAVAC from top to bottom. And after you've HEPAVAC everything from top to bottom, you wet wash from top to bottom. You don't want to allow any dust and debris to fly around, so don't sweep, don't dry dust, don't use a non HEPA vacuum because then you're just redistributing the hazard. For wet washing, you can use disposable wipes that you can throw away, things like Swiffer for your floor that you can throw away or ones that you can take home and wash in the washing machine when they're dirty. As much as the environmentalist I me mean, hates this thought, you know, that is the easiest route for cleaning is paper towels and a spray cleaner, wipe an area and then throw it away and then the contamination is gone. If you are going to use something like a cloth or a sponge or a mop, the gold standard is a three bucket method where you can keep always keep your cleaning water clean. So you'd have one container that's your cleaning solution, one container that's your rinse solution, and one that's an empty. And you'd take your clean sponge or your mop, put it in the cleaning solution, clean a little bit, wring it out, rinse it really good, wring it out into the empty, and then put it back in your cleaning solution. That way your cleaning solution is always clean. Because once your cleaning solution is dirty, you're just, again, moving the contamination from point A to point B. And the dirt as well. Even if there wasn't lead involved, think about once your mop bucket gets dirty, are you really cleaning or are you just moving the dirt from one room to the other and it looks nice and clean while it's wet and then it dries and there's just as much dirt there as before. So three bucket method if you're gonna do that way or disposable cleaning wipes and things like that. Safely dispose of your dirty water. Don't dump it out the back door. Again, you're just transferring contamination. Same thing if don't dump it in the sink or the tub, you can leave some contamination behind. And the best thing to do is dump your dirty water in the toilet. Always check your work. If it still looks dirty, you didn't do a good enough job. So it needs to really look clean and be clean. And you do this cleaning after any work. And as the video showed, you clean the you know, immediate area where you did the work and then you clean out a little bit just in case something escaped your containment. So you do it every time you do any work and that's the general work area. Say if you only worked in one room, you only have to clean that one room after the work is done. Change a tenant, you have to clean the entire unit, all horizontal surfaces, top to bottom, HEPAVAC, wet wash, every time there's a change of tenant. There should be no moving a tenant out and moving a tenant in on the same day because to go in and do your visual, to do your cleaning, to do any work that might need to be done, that's going to take more than a day. So give yourself some time between change of tenants so that you can do all that you need to do. Also common areas one time a year. So a common area would be like a common hallway that they all go through into to get into the building, you know, common stairwell, uh, common laundry room, mailbox area, somewhere where all the tenants have to go through. If you have separate entrances and mailboxes and all of that for each unit in the building, then you don't have a common area and that's one thing you don't have to do. But if you have a question about whether it's a common area or not, I would talk with the regulatory program. But basically, I would say if more than one tenant has to be in that area to do business in the building, then it's a common area and you have to clean it one time a year. So those are the three times you have to clean. After any work is done, change a tenant and common area once a year. Your HEPA vacuum is a very important piece of equipment that you're definitely going to need if you're doing work in pre-78 rental properties and childcare facilities. You, it has to be by law 
a vacuum cleaner device with an included high efficiency particulate air, which is what HEPA stands for, filter through which contaminated air flows. No aftermarket HEPA filters added to a non-HEPA machine. I've seen people take their shop vac and just add a HEPA filter. That doesn't work for this law. It has to be a actual HEPA vacuum advertised on the box, says HEPA, that captures at least 99.97% of airborne particles of at least 0.3 microns in diameter. Has to say that in order to be considered a HEPA vacuum and in order for you to use for cleaning. You do have the option of just wet cleaning everything, but that's gonna take forever. It's gonna be very difficult. If you have a property that's pre-78, you're, you're gonna need a HEPA vacuum. They used to be very expensive. You can get a decent one for the same price as a good vacuum cleaner nowadays. But you do want to make sure that you operate them in accordance with the instructions, which usually means that you want to make sure you change the filters on the correct regularity. You know, those and basically with a HEPA vacuum, the differences are is usually the machine is tire fit overall. So what you suck into it actually doesn't leak out the seams has a better bag itself, which, which collects a lot of the things. But the big thing is that final exhaust filter where the air comes back out is a much finer filter. If that's not a HEPA filter there, then again, you're just shooting the dust out the other end of the vacuum cleaner and you're just redistributing it. So you're, you're probably gonna need a HEPA vacuum if you're gonna do and have rental property and childcare facilities in a pre-78 building. It's a good investment to make. You won't regret it. For waste disposal, I really recommend the strong contractor bags so that if you've got pieces of wood and different things in there, so it, you know, it doesn't poke through the bag and you don't drag contamination everywhere. If you look at the video, they talk about goosenecking. And the reason they do that is, is you know, picture your your regular bag you've gathered it at the top you've kind of spun it around taped around that and then you drop it there's still an opening a very small late you know when you wrapped it around and stuff there's still a little air that can come out so if you drop it and there's dry contamination in there it can poof out the top so don't fill the bag totally up to the top gather it and then uh tape around that and then take that top part of the, the plastic bag, bend it over and tape it again. So you've created like a little loop, a closed loop at the top. Not only does it create a handy dandy little handle for you to carry it, but if you drop it now, nothing inside can escape out the top. So that's why you gooseneck. And the big thing is it's just like camping. If you bring it in, you bring it out. I use a lot of gloves because when I take my dust samples I've got the little packages that the dust wipe came in I've got a pair of gloves that I have to change for each sample so I end up with a big you know ball of stuff and people are always like oh just throw that in my garbage nope it's possibly contaminated I have to bring it out with me I throw it away at home so your job is just like that if if the plastic the garbage bags your wipes your mop, all of that stuff leaves with you. If you have a dumpster at the property that is your dumpster, you can put the garbage in there because nobody's going to get into the dumpster. But if it's just some garbage bags in the garage where the tenants have access to it, don't leave it there. They can get into it or a raccoon can get into it and spread it around and then the kids can play out in the garage. So the best bet is to bring it home with you, throw it away with your regular garbage or bring it to the dump yourself. And you can dispose of everything just like regular trash. It doesn't have to go to a special area, just bring it to the dump. One thing to think about is if you're not disturbing a surface. So say again, that riding toy went through the doorway and just took a, a ding out of the paint. It doesn't need any scraping and wet scraping and wet sanding because it's just, you know, solid all around and you just need to touch up the surface. If no prep is needed and no surface is going to be disturbed, you don't need to have an EMP certification to paint. What I've seen some landlords do is, you know, you go through, change a tenant, you've cleaned, you've you've painted, you've washed, you, you've got everything ready for the next tenant. 
I've seen some landlords give the tenant a little jar of, in a paintbrush of the paint that um, they used. That way, when the family's moving in and they do knock that doorway with the dining room table when they're carrying it in, that they just go back and, like I said, if there's no prep needed and it's just taking the paintbrush and going right onto that surface, anybody can do it. And it keeps it from becoming a bigger job later. Because sometimes if you have that little ding out of there, the kids look at it and say, oh, that means I should pick it to see if I can make it bigger. So sometimes those little areas of deterioration are, are a clarion call for a child who wants to pick things. So anybody can just do those quick little spot paints. But if you're disturbing a surface, so it needs some wet scraping and wet sanding, it needs more than just a quick little daub of paint on it, then you do have to be certified. And we always think of painters when we think of disturbing a surface, but there's a lot of people in the contracting world that could dis disturb a painted surface. So a painter, carpenter, plumber, electrician, weatherization, any of those people that disturb a painted surface need at least an EMP certification. So that's something to think about when you have the big water leak and the carpenter has to come in and start tearing out stuff to replace things. They actually need to be EMP certified as well or supervised by somebody who's EMP certified. And that brings me to anybody disturbing a surface will need to be at least certified or supervised on site. So if you've got a work crew of 10 and they're going to be doing the outside of the house, only one of those 10 needs to be EMP certified. But that EMP certified person needs to tell everybody how to do it, show them, you know, train them how to do it safely and be on site at all times during that job. That EMP certified person has to be there at all times. They can't tell the non-certified people what to do and then leave. So not everybody has to be certified, but at least one EMP certified person needs to be there at all times supervising. So 75% of Vermont housing is pre-78. If you work on rental housing and child care facilities, you need at least this EMP certification. So pretty easy stuff. So soil, we've talked about this a little bit previously, but one at least once every 365 days, you have to remove all visible paint chips from the property. So that's everywhere on the prop, the ground, you know, uh, inside, you know, it's, it's part of your visual is to make sure there's no visible paint chips anywhere inside or out, at least once every 365 days. Again, it's something you would be looking for it, change a tenant and things like that as well. We talked a little bit earlier about the bare soil area within two to three feet of the building. We call that the drip line. It's often highly contaminated. It's a popular play area in some of these rental properties. You don't have a big yard anyway, so a lot of times the kids play right close to the building. So it's a double whammy of a popular play area and usually highly contaminated. So if it's bare, if, if you've already got grass, I'm not, I'm not talking about a already grassed area because that's one of the things you can do, plant grass. But usually it's bare because it's shady or the water hits it and the grass won't grow there. That's why you have bare soil around that, in that area. So if grass won't grow there, you can do the four to six inches of mulch stone, new dirt. It looks nice anyways, and it provides protection from that contaminated soil and nothing edible. You can plant pricky bushes and, and bushes and things like that to keep the it, people out of the area, but don't let anybody plant anything edible close to around an old foundation line. I've seen some places where they throw a couple tomato plants or something like that close to the back door because that's the only place they got. Those plantings suck up lead and you can have lead into the in the vegetables. So no edible plantings. And don't forget under the porch. A lot of times, you know, under the porch can be a really fun, think back to when you were a kid and you wanted the little, you know, hideaway. Under the porch was actually, if you're not afraid of spiders, that would be a really good place to have a play area. And usually the soil's bare under there and it's close to the building. So 
not an area that you want to have accessible. So I recommend blocking off around the edges of the porch with like a lattice or something like that so that nothing can get under that porch. So again, we recommend covering the bare soil if it's bare within two to three feet of the building, cover with four to six inches of material. All of the stuff previous was kind of, you know, things that you probably already knew how to do or had seen done, but just in maybe a little bit different and safer way. The window well inserts are kind of a whole new ball game, but they're not as terrifying and hard as it seems at first. So I really definitely recommend using our manual at this point. I'm not going to go into huge depth, but in the manual, there is a step-by-step -step pictorial that my friend Bob Zatsky did years ago on how to do a window well insert. And it's a really great step-by-step. -step. He really broke it down. So I recommend that you definitely look through that at least a few times and have it open when you do your first window well inserts yourself. So window well inserts go into all wooden windows constructed before 1978. A window well insert has to be all three of these things. All three, can't just be one or two. It's gotta be all three of these things. It has to be smooth, has to be cleanable, and it has to be durable. Smooth because the, the point of a window well insert, and people think it's to keep the paint that's under there from coming up, but really, and the window well is the area I always describe is the area between the double hung windows where all the dead, flies and paint chips hang out. So it's a pretty dirty area. It's a lot of times it's pitted and cracked because there's a lot of weathering from the outside. So it's a hard area to keep clean. The window well insert, the point of it is to make that area smooth and cleanable. In order to cover that area, you need an insert that's smooth, cleanable, and durable. So that's the point of that window well insert is to make that area easier to clean. This picture kind of goes through what a typical double hung window where you've got your inside window sash. That's the part that goes up and down. And then you've got that area in between that and the outside window. And that's the window well. Some windows, you don't have that second, you know, if, if they're not double hung, you might just have where the sash goes up and down. And then you've got the exterior part of the windowsill. In that case, the window well is th is where that sash sits when you close the window. So even if you don't have the double hung windows, you have a window well. It might just be where that sash sits. But if you have double hung windows, it's usually a very obvious separate area. We always used to recommend when the law started years ago that you used Aluminum coil stock, because that's what most people use, it's easy to use, and that you nail it. Well, as you can see from the little picture in the right-hand corner, if you nail it and you hit it a little too hard so that it kind of creates a little indent along with the nail, water can get in there, follow the nail down through into the wood underneath, and rot out your window. So unless you can perfectly hit the nail each time so that it looks like the bottom picture that says yes, which I have a hard time hitting the same place twice, much less having my nails look that perfect. So I recommend you not use nails at all. You just use the liquid nails and then caulk around the edges. It's not a friction and impact surface. It's not a movable surface. It's not going anywhere if you use the liquid nails on the underside of the insert and then caulk around the edges. So most people use aluminum coil stock. You can get that at any hardware home store type place. It comes in a coil. It's relatively cheap. It's pretty easy to work with. You can use tin snips to cut it or you can score it with a exacto knife, a carpenter's knife thing there and then bend it and it'll break at the score. So it's pretty easy to work with and it's relatively cheap. But you can really use anything that will create that smooth, cleanable and durable surface. One recommendation is that don't assume that you measure one window well and all your windows are the same. In these old houses, a lot of times they're all different. So measure each one, cut your window well insert 
and dry fit it before putting your liquid nails and stuff down just to make sure it fits because each one could be a little different. So use the liquid nails, not metal nails. Caulk all the edges so that no water can get underneath because again, you don't want water to get underneath because you didn't caulk an edge because then it, again the water is going to sit there and rot out your window well. So caulk all the edges but if I go back to the previous slide and you look at where it says weep hole it's like the little round hole that's in the outside window sometimes it's a little hole sometimes it's just a little channel don't cover that weep hole because that's there on purpose where if water gets in and it gets has a way to get out. Window well inserts must be in all pre-78 wooden windows if they are manufactured to open. So if they're painted shut, you got to either open them, um, you know, crack them open, um, which could create more painting work for you. Or I've had some landlords tell me that it's easier to go in from the outside. Um, so but but if the window was made to open, you, it's got to have a window well insert. Um, if it doesn't have, so like screw out windows or sliding windows or bay windows that don't open, those don't need window well inserts. If the entire unit, if the entire window unit was replaced after 1978, then you don't have to do the window well inserts. But you have to be able to prove that those were put in after 1978. So if you've got like, a permit when you did the windows or you've got your receipt, whatever. But other than that, if it's they're all pre-78 wooden windows need the posters, which are in your manual or on our website. You can print them out on our website. They need to be in each common area or in each individual unit. Some of the tips that I've seen because I go into places all the time where I tell the landlords, you don't have your poster up and they're like, we put them up, they take them down some of the things that can help with that. If it's in a common area, say downstairs in the hallway next to the mailboxes or whatever, if you just put a piece of paper there, it curls up, it gets dirty, it gets wet, people are going to take it down. So I recommend you can either laminate them to make them sturdier, or I've even seen people, and it kind of makes it look a little nice, is if you just get a cheap picture frame that it fits into and hang it there and that poster needs to have the information of the name address and phone number of whoever the tenants would contact if they need the paint fixed so that all has to be on that poster if you don't have a common area you put them in each individual unit again if you just hang them on their wall people are going to take them down we recommend the inside of a kitchen cupboard because people open them, they see it, but they're not going to take it down because it's not out in public where everybody's going to see it. So I recommend that you get like some of those sleeve protectors that you can put the poster in. You can put the pamphlet in there. You can put a copy of your lease in there, copy of the compliance statement, and then have that hanging on the inside of a kitchen cabinet. The pamphlet that you have to give people, and this is a federal as well as a state rule, is the protect your family from lead in the home. It's in your manual or it's on our website or it's on the EPA website as well. You give it to every prospective tenant and any new tenant. That Again, it's just information so that people are aware. You can put it inside the kitchen cabinet with the poster. And part of the federal disclosure that we talk about in a minute is giving them this pamphlet as well. The pamphlet is dual purpose, covers the state law as well as the federal law, and it's just got some good information in there. Basically telling people, hey, an old place can have lead. This is what to be careful of. This is what you should do. Feed your kids good nutrition, shoes off at the door, wash hands, things like that. Education and information is key. And that's what the posters and the pamphlet provide. The compliance statements, that's the final thing for the Vermont lead law. You did your visual, you either found that work needed to be done or didn't, you've done the work safely, you've done your cleaning either after the work or change a tenant, got your posters up, you've given people their protect your family from lead in the home pamphlet, you think you're all done. You're still out of compliance with the law if you haven't done your compliance statement. 
say if we get an anonymous tip that 123 Main Street isn't in compliance with the law, the first thing we're going to do is look for this compliance statement. If we don't find a compliance statement, you're assumed to be out of the law, out of compliance. Even if you've done everything else and physically the place is great, and, but this is the final thing you got to do to be in compliance with the law. The compliance statement is something that you have to submit every at least once every 365 days. It's online. It's all electronic. It's a nice intuitive thing where it'll ask you the question. If you say no, it'll skip the questions that pertain to that and go to the next one. So it's a really nice, easy online document. A copy, once you do it, a copy goes to the tenants within 10 days. You can either give them a physical copy of it, or I believe there's a link after you do it online that you can email it to your tenants. The link is in the documents to how to go to the site where this compliance statement is. It's a two-step process. First, you have to create an account. So you click on, you get to the website, you click create an account, you put your information in, you create a password, and then you're going to click submit. You can't immediately start doing your compliance statements for your properties. Once you click submit, that goes to the regulatory program, then you're gonna receive an email with a link in it. You have to click on that link within three days. It'll take you back to that site. You sign in, so don't lose your password and your username. And then you can go back in and add the properties. Once they're in there, you don't have to keep adding them every year. Once they're in there, you just have to go in that once every 365 days and click on the property and do your compliance statement. You need to use the E911 address for the property. So it's gotta be 123 Main Street, not corner of state and main. It, the compliance statement needs to be completed by the owner or a designated property manager. The owner does not have to be EMP certified. I don't know if you guys are owners, contractors, property managers, what you are, child care providers, but the owner of the property has to be the one to do the compliance statement. As an owner, you can hire people to do the EMPs and they would then have their EMP number that they would give to you and you could do the compliance statement using their dates, their information. You can designate a property manager, but you have to do it within the system. Say you're a property manager. The first thing you have to do is create an account for yourself in this system. Then the owner has to go in, find you, and designate you as the property manager for that property. And then you as the property manager can do the compliance statement. So those are the two people. It's not the contractor or anybody else. It's the owner or their designated property manager that has to do the compliance statement. It's at least once every 365 days. Say you've bought a property and the previous owner always did it in January. You can continue to do it in January. Just be aware that doing work even inside can be problematic in the wintertime because you have to turn off the heating system. You, you know, really can't open windows to ventilate, things like that. So a lot of people prefer to have their due dates in the time when they're going to have to do the work during the summer or at least the construction season. So what you can do is say it was last done January 15th, but you really want August 15th as your deadline. So do it again in August. Every time you do the compliance statement, it restarts that 365 day clock. So you can do it sooner, you just can't do it past the 365 days. And you can also spread out your properties. If you've got a lot of properties and you don't want them to do all at the same time, you know, do a couple in June, couple in July, couple in August, however you want to do it. So you can kind of play around with that and create your own due date, but it is due at least once every 365 days. What you are and what you are not, because it can be confusing because there's a lot of different terminologies in the lead world. You are EMP certified to comply with the Vermont state lead law. That's what you are. You are not a licensed lead inspector risk assessor. A lot more schooling, a lot more training, licensing, 
all of that stuff. You are not a licensed lead abatement contractor. Again, schooling, training, licensing, permitting. All you can do is your EMPs, which is your cleaning, your paint stabilization, your small stuff. That's what you are certified to do as an EMP certified individual. You cannot test, you cannot abate, you're just fixing the paint and doing some cleaning. So this class is Vermont specific. It only provides EMP certification, nothing else. There's other stuff out there, which we'll talk about the federal RRP rule. This is a very Vermont specific law. So it only works in Vermont. So we're gonna talk a little bit about leasing a residential rental property. This is the federal disclosure rule. So this isn't a Vermont thing, it's a federal thing. It's the EPA. The Vermont law does require the same pamphlet, so you don't have to do two things. So the Vermont law and federal law requires that before signing a lease for housing built before 1978, the renters must receive the following from the landlord. So it's the protect your family from lead in the home that's in your manual on the website. A copy of the most recent EMP compliance statement. Again, 10 days if the tenant's are already there, but if uh, you get a new tenant, you need to give them a copy of that most recent compliance statement. Disclosure, which is letting people know any known information concerning the presence of lead-based paint or lead-based paint hazards. There's a stock statement on the sample disclosure form that basically says the house is built before 1978, there could be lead. If you've ever had any kind of testing, you've had an inspection, you've had samples, anything where you have results of something, that's now disclosable. You have to give that to people before they move in. And the lead warning statement, the disclosure statement is something that you sign and the tenant signs. This is a sample of that form and you can see at the top the lead warning statement. Houses, housing built before 1978 may contain lead-based paint. It can be harmful, da, 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 da. And then there's the leaseor, which is you as the, the owner. If you have any knowledge of the presence of lead-based paint or hazards, you either check that you know there's hazards or that you don't know there's hazards. If you've never had any testing, then you check off the leaseor has no knowledge. If you have had anything tested and you go under the records and reports available and you would check that you provided it or that you don't have any records, check one or the other. And then you initial it, the leasee initials that they received the copies of all the information that they received the pamphlet. And then you sign it, they sign it. If you have an agent, they sign it. This is federal law and there's big fines involved if you don't do disclosure. I would recommend if you have a written lease that you provide that you just add that disclosure page into the written lease. You can kind of create your own, but it has to have pretty much all the same language. So I would just use the sample one that's provided. It's on our website, it's in your manual, and you could find it on the EPA website as well. It's information for tenants, which is helpful for everybody, and it's a federal law. There's also real estate transactions. This can be a little confusing, but this is if you're buying or selling a pre-78 rental property. It doesn't really work with childcare facilities, but if you're buying or selling a pre-78 property, prior to the time of sale, real estate agents, sellers, or transfers of title must provide the buyer or the transferee with educational materials. On our website, it has a list of all those educational materials as well as a link so you can have them all to give. Prior to the time of sale and purchase and sales agreement, the seller must disclose to the buyer whether AEMPs have been completed and if a current EMP compliance statement has been filed with the Department of Health. Anybody can go to the website and look up a property. So if you're looking to buy a property, you can go to that same place um, where you're going to do your compliance statements, click on search and put in the address and you can find out whether there's a recent compliance statement on file. But they should tell you that if you're buying. 
And if you're selling, you need to tell them that. The seller must ensure that the rental disclosure form is signed by the seller and the buyer and emailed or mailed to the Department of Health using the address at the bottom of the form. So you can find all of this stuff at our website. So there is actually a form that you as the seller have to sign and the buyer has to sign saying that you did what the real estate disclosure was. As the seller, the best thing to do is have it in compliance before you try to sell it. As a buyer, you wanna make sure it's in compliance physically as well as paperwork wise. If it's not in compliance, you can still buy the building. Just know that you've got 60 days to bring it into compliance. And you might also have a little bit of a bargaining chip with the seller saying, hey, it's not in compliance with the law. I'm going to have to bring it into compliance. How about you take this offer? It either has to be in compliance or this buyer has to acknowledge that it's not in compliance, that they now have to bring it into compliance. And this is all on the web page dedicated to real estate professionals. So if you go on to healthvermont.gov, and I did in the little search bar at the top, I put in real estate and it takes you right to lead and asbestos in real estate. If at any time, even if when you buy it, you have 60 days to bring it into compliance unless you are granted an extension. But even just regularly, say you you find a problem, you've got 30 days to fix it and something happens where you don't think you're gonna get it fixed within 30 days, contact the regulatory program, ask for an extension, explain why, there's a form you have to fill out. If it's for a good reason, you'll probably get granted an extension. I wouldn't wait until 29 of 30 days though. If it looks like you're not gonna be able to hit the 30 days, talk to the regulatory program. Failure to bring the property into compliance carries a mandatory civil penalty. So there are fees and fines and penalties involved in non-compliance. So the RRP rule that I've referenced a few times. See, back in 96, when the Vermont Lead Law passed, we were kind of the only game in town. There was no other states that were kind of doing what we were doing, so it was our thing. Then a few years back, the feds passed their own lead safety paint law. Um, it's the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and it's called the Renovation, Repair and P Painting or RRP rule. So anyone who disturbs more than six square feet of paint inside or 20 square feet of paint outside needs to be RRP certified. And this applies to what we've been talking about for the lead law, which is pre-78 rental housing and childcare facilities, but this actually also applies to owner-occupied. For, so for those of you who are contractors, it doesn't matter with this federal rule, whether it's a rental or owner-occupied, you still need that RRP certification. But for those of you who are gonna be EMP certified and you're working in your rental property or childcare facility, you have the small window between zero and six feet inside that you can do with just your EMP certification. If the job is going to be disturbing more than six square feet of paint inside, you now have to be RRP certified as well. And for the outside, you have between zero and 20 square feet that you can disturb and just have this EMP certification. Once the job goes over 20 square feet of disturbing, then you need to be RRP certified as well. If you're EMP certified, you've taken this class, you passed the, the test, you got your certificate, you can do small jobs inside and outside your rental property or childcare facility with just your EMP certification. Once you go over disturbing more than six square feet inside or 20 square feet outside, you also need RRP certification. You can find, there's a link to where to find classes in the documents. It's leadsafevermont.org has a list of the trainings, or you can go to the EPA site directly, search by state, and you can find out when these RRP classes are being offered. And again, if you're a contractor and you're working in owner-occupied homes, you're gonna need this certification as well. For OSHA, 
just a, a quick little thing about Occupational Safety and Health Administration. If you're an employer, so you're a contractor who has a, a crew or you are a landlord who has a maintenance crew, you're an employer, you need to make sure that you follow all the safety uh, guidelines that OSHA has for lead as well as other things. So look that up. Look up OSHA or Vermont OSHA, which is uh, VOSHA, um, and make sure that you're complying with all the things you have to do to keep your employees safe. If you are an employee, make sure your boss is keeping you safe. So you should be familiar with the guidelines too, just to make sure your boss isn't asking you to do something that's unsafe for you or unsafe for others. If you have a concern that you're being asked to do something unsafe, you can report any unsafe working conditions to VOSHA. So if you just do a search for VOSHA or Vermont OSHA, you'll get to their website and there's a complaint process. VOSHA, this is a Vermont law. You also need to make sure you're following all other federal and state requirements for rental property and child care facilities. So it's not just the lead law. You've got rental housing health code. There's electrical, there's heating, there's plumbing, there's pests. There's all sorts of things that you need to consider as a owner. Make sure you familiarize yourself with all of that because ignorance of the law is not a defense, unfortunately. How to contact the Asbestos and Lead Regulatory Program. You can contact them by email at empcompliance at vermont.gov. You can call 802-863-7220 or there's a toll free number as well, 800-439-8550. And our website is healthvermont.gov backslash environment backslash asbestos lead. Or like I said, just the easiest thing I find is to go to healthvermont.gov and click search and then you can search lead paint, asbestos, real estate, whatever you might be interested in. On their site is also a anonymous tip place where if you see somebody doing something unsafe, you can report it and they can follow up and make sure that safe work practices are being done by all.